good morning good afternoon good evening whichever part of the world you are in welcome to this special panel on living with covid endemicity in the horasis you know us meeting 2022 i am glad to welcome all of you over here i would like to introduce my co-panelists to you we have david berrett from the united states and uh, yoshiki san from of course japan uh, we are talking about covid and its endemicity and what it means for the world in the present and in the future which has become i think a very very important we are now after all completing the second year almost of covid in fact for some geographies beyond 2 years now of this pandemic uh, who would have thought it would have lasted so long uh, it's been a once in a century uh, a pandemic which is now moving of course as a lot of experts tell us towards endemicity what does that mean for us what does that mean for society what does that mean for geopolitics and geoeconomics are some of the things that we would like to explore over the next few 45 minutes that we have here in this horasis panel i would like to begin by uh, inviting our panelists to introduce themselves and i shall of course start it myself my name is professor aditya singh i am the founder and director of the athena school of management which is a very exclusive business school based out of mumbai in india which focuses on which focuses on impact leadership sustainability and circularity stakeholder management and internationalization collaboration i also wear another hat when i am the founder and co-managing director of a venture capital firm called Prometheus Nova Ventures based out of Chicago in Illinois in the United States which is an early stage ESG fund which focuses a lot on education and technology uh, i have the good fortune of sitting on advisory board of several companies across the world focusing on entrepreneurship innovation leadership sustainability and digital transformation and it's obviously a pleasure and a privilege to be chairing this panel i would now like to request my co-panelists to introduce them introduce themselves May I start with David, please? David, could you please take the floor or the screen in this case? Sure. Well, first, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I'm David Berry. Um, I am CEO of Valo Health and general partner of Flagship Pioneering, uh, MD PhD by background, a serial entrepreneur. I've started about 35 companies across health, energy, and agriculture over the last 15, 20 years. Thanks, David. Yoshiki San. Okay uh hello uh, my name is Yoshiki Sasaki I'm a founder and CEO of a company group called Social Impact Solutions which does two main things one is a home health care service uh, we are now one of the biggest operation in Japan right now uh, which uh, deliver doctor home and then uh, the other one is the, the very early stage uh, startup ecosystem building from founding stage investment to accelerate the management and then uh, arranging partnerships with, with the bigger companies and M&A arrangements so from entry to exit of the startups we are working and we are trying to extend that globally thank you so much yoshiki san uh by the very nature pandemics uh you know peter out when you have uh, run out of hosts in this case human beings to host the, the virus typically right i mean that's that that's a uh, normal wisdom for us and that's how it works uh when we started when this entire journey uh about january or february of 2020 uh, we assumed and we were told there'll be one major wave or maybe two major waves of this pandemic uh, and and then the first wave came and then we had the delta wave and then of course we had the omicron wave uh different geographies different countries are you know facing it in their own way uh but uh the question is is this the last wave who knows but what we've seen definitely is that the society is moving towards a situation now where it is becoming part and parcel of our daily lives some people even say oh don't worry about it it's going to be just like the flu which is going to come every season you're going to have it and then you're going to move on uh that puts very some very interesting questions that to play the other dynamic in this of course is we have seen and this is again a surprising metric is the amount of refusals to take vaccinations in this entire horrible journey of the past two years and surprise or surprise it's more from the developing world than it is from the developed world from the global north as compared to the global south now that again begs questions does that affect the entire movement from being a pandemic to an endemic or what happens in that situation typically Now the first question which I'd like to ask you know ourselves of course is how are we coping with this how is the local situation in our local geographies and and where do we see this evolving before I then start putting some pointed questions to our co-panelists and ask them how it goes I'll begin with India 
uh, we are now towards the ebb of the uh, wave of the third wave, which is the Omicron. We had a particularly devastating uh, situation over here with the Delta variant to the second wave. Uh, it caught us in, in a huge tsunami of cases. Uh, you know, uh, we were much better prepared for this thing with the Omicron, which of course has been much more infectious, but luckily has been, as of now, what we see from figures, far less fatal when it comes to the fatality rate. Uh, to be very honest, society in India is getting back to the closest to normal, as we can call it. People are out on the streets. They're going on with their lives. Of course, they're wearing masks, which is important. But otherwise, people are saying it's time for us to move on because, of course, the economic pain of this entire pandemic, and this is what Sandhu Chariwan was you know, warning us about, has been tremendous, especially in the global south. I think there is a perception and there's a clear-cut feeling in, in India and perhaps some other countries that now COVID is something which you've got to live with. So you might as well live with it and move on with your lives rather than putting everything at a halt uh, you know, for, for the next few months. But of course, that is a view from India, what we can see. Uh, David, would love to have your inputs from how it's going in the United States and the Western Hemisphere. So uh, I think it's a great question. Um, and I think one of the things I think that we've learned about COVID is while everyone has become uh, a world expert epidemiologist, I think we've also learned that we've all been wrong about every single prediction that we've collectively and individually made. So I think there's a couple things that I look at, which is, one, it's, it's great to see that the Omicron wave has proved to be uh, less lethal on a per capita basis than some of the prior ones. Uh, and there may be some opportunity, if you will, in, the, in that as it helps us to potentially move to more of an endemic phase. Um, so I think that's been particularly interesting as we think about kind of the progression of uh, the progression of COVID. But we also have to make sure we're not missing the numbers and the trends. So if you look at the United States data, we can take this for whatever it is, because there's all sorts of errors and biases in the data that exists. When you look at the first peak of COVID that exists and the number of people who died per day on an average basis, it's about the same as what it is right now. It's a really interesting fact point. Now on a per capita basis, on a per infection basis, that's way down. But it's interesting because of course, there's a mental state that we're coming back to normal, that we can start not wearing our masks, that everything is okay again. Now, of course, there's a huge differentiation between people who are vaccinated and people who don't. But at the same time, this is still something that's having real effects on many, many people's lives. And I think we can't lose sight of that. The other thing that I think is an interesting phenomena, and I feel like uh, has gotten broadly forgotten, is that coronaviruses, of which, of course, COVID is a subset, um, are weakly immunogenic, and they're not very good at causing natural immunity. Now, natural immunity does exist. That is a thing that has developed. It can be very powerful, but it's not always. And we've seen the evidence of that because we probably all know many people who've gotten Omicron multiple times. And the notion, the notion of a weakly immunogenic virus would be very consistent with multiple cases of Omicron in the same person. So I think we have to be very careful about thinking that we're free and clear because just as we've seen the consistency of variation, there will be more variants of this. COVID is not a random, uh, is, is not a random event. It's a particularly bad form of coronavirus. An average person has been, has been exposed to 10 to 15 types of coronavirus over an average life. And so as we think about that, there will be a next Greek letter and a next Greek letter and a next Greek letter. The question is, do they matter societally? And we don't know that as of yet. Um, what we do know is there's a pattern that these things get bad and recover in about two months. That seems to be what seems to be consistent. But I think we're going to have to see how the virus evolves and what happens after that. The good thing is in many communities, there's been significant vaccine uptake. And I think we've seen clear evidence that the vaccines work. Uh, I think that's great because... Well, it may not eliminate infection. It reduces a lot of the harm. And I think that's particularly, that's particularly exciting and speaks to the power of medicine and speaks to, frankly, the power of, some of the, even some of these new uh, technologies like mRNA therapeutics and the opportunity that exists on being able to translate that, that into real human impact. So from my perspective, um, I think it's great to be able to see the power of biotechnology deliver literally change that has impacted the world and do so in such a short period of time. Thanks, David, for, for, for some amazing insights on that. 
Yoshi, I would love to have your insights. Okay, uh, first I would tell what is happening in Japan. And the, the death rate in Japan is very small uh, relative to the number of infections. And uh, that is because uh, society, in, in our society in general, people are very cautious. And uh, especially it is told that the senior people have more risks, so they uh, mostly refrain from going out, for example. And uh, we also have uh, dependency in each different community. Therefore, for example, if you see the rate of wearing masks, we will be among the top in the world. And also, uh, the most people are now going into sub-vaccination, sub and that also prevents uh, the uh, people becoming more serious symptoms. Therefore, uh, for the moment, uh, the death rate of the people is uh, on the surface less than the normal year uh, who die from normal influenza. And, the, and that is uh, become comparable if you just see the bracket of people over 70. So now we are in a social situation that this is now controlled uh, at the normal other viruses. Therefore, the government is now starting to opening up the border and the, uh, the life is now returning to the normal. Of course, we still have some reg uh, regression that the drinking houses has to uh, shorten the operational time, but that's only the limitation. So, and also, as uh, after uh, infected, uh, we have a, a hospital system uh, as a normal situation, but uh, we also have a home health care uh, backup. Therefore, uh, basically, these days, people are uh, told to stay home, even they are infected. And if they become serious, then the doctor will examine if they will be hospital. They should be hospitalized or not. And then they come to the hospital. Then, uh, therefore, this kind of social triage system is now working. And that probably will also affect you to the next wave. So people are gradually learning what we need to protect and what we need to uh, I mean, uh, uh, admit, for example. And uh, the, the point uh, we want to see is our economic uh, activity level and also the death toll. So uh, for other things, uh, we have to arrange socially. Of course, there is... Uh, more and more therapeutic solution will be coming up. Therefore, uh, that uh, makes us prepared for the next wave, I think. So. Thank you, Yoshiki-san. Now, you know, we keep hearing about new vaccines coming into play. We have the Moderna one, we have the Pfizer one, we have the AstraZeneca one. In fact, you know, India is one of the largest manufacturers of vaccines in the world. Uh, so, you know, but we keep hearing that, you know, new variants come in. Uh, one vaccine may not be enough by the other variant. You had people saying, oh, Omicron is a different you know, piece of action. Oh, you're lucky Omicron has come in on. And now you're going to get this new version of Delta and Omicron called Delta, Delta Cron. And, uh, you know, God knows what. I mean, uh, the, the question is just how many vaccines uh, are we supposed to take? Is it going to be, uh, you know, that a cycle is going to be every six months you end up taking a booster shot? It's very interesting. Some countries have opened up international travel, but they're very clear that you need to have had your second dose of vaccine and a booster not more than six months before you travel to that nation. So, you know, it's not completely free travel. What does it mean from an economic perspective? A, of course, from, from the cost of manufacture. That's one part of the story but also per, from perspective of society having to retake a vaccination every six months, that's first. And are we also looking at, at, at now advent of, uh, you know, and I would love for David perhaps to take this, of cures. You know, I mean, people are talking about, it's just about, you know, prevention. It's about the curative part also, where you can actually cure certain variants of the entire, uh, you know, pandemic uh, so that it, the COVID thing, you know, actually doesn't become a major thing. So it's already, even if you have it, there is a cure available. Would love to have your inputs on that, David. 
Sure. Um, so let me let me try to piece piece that apart because I said there's a lot in there. Um, so for, first of all, I mean I think the as, as we think about what's happened, right, this has been first of all, um, and I it's always it's always a slightly uncomfortable talking about some of the good things that have happened in the context of the COVID pandemic, but it's been a huge boon for innovation. And in part of what we do at Flagship is we invent technologies, launch companies. We've had the great privilege of being the firm that launched Moderna. And in that context, what was, what's interesting is we can roll the clock back 12 years or so to the beginning of Moderna, and the notion of making mRNA therapeutics was completely foreign. And what's fascinating is where we sit today. There are more people that have now taken mRNA therapeutics than have taken protein therapeutics over the 50-odd year history of biotechnology. So I think it's, it's a very exciting time from an innovation perspective. And, and we can now look at things like the development of vaccines and think about just how quickly we can go from uh, a virus breaking out to a genome, to a vaccine, to getting into the clinic, to having it approved and having it in patients. I mean, we haven't seen things like this um, potentially ever at the speed and scale, particularly scale. That, that we're seeing it now. So from that perspective, I think it's very much worth our taking the benefits of that lesson and, and taking that to heart. Now, again, I think we're in this era where we're still trying to figure a lot of this out. I mean, I think the, the good and the bad is, I think the, the data that people talk about, I think uh, Joe Biden in the State of the Union was talking about something like, um, um, uh, and I may, I may misquote, but, it, but somewhere in the neighborhood of about 70 days from, uh, the, from something uh, something identified to being able to have a reasonable uh, vaccine being in people, which plus or even even if it's plus or minus, is a tremendous time. The issue, though, is that um, when you look at these peaks and troughs, they last about sixty. So um, the timelines still don't quite match up. And and I think what we've seen is as we've gone through variants and variant after variant, I think there's been sort of a catch up effort to try to. See, hey, can we add something to the next booster? Can we add something? But it's almost that these these new these new evolutions are becoming retrospective as opposed to prospective. So I think, do we need one for Omicron? Well, we're pretty clearly at what looks like from a epidemiological standpoint, we're getting to the trough. Hopefully, the back end. Um, do we know what the next one looks like? Well, not yet. And I think this is going to be one of the really interesting things for us to start thinking about, because where we want to go is a society to be able to predict. And frankly, this is not limited to COVID. We'd love to be able to predict any epidemic, any pandemic. Frankly, we'd love to be able to predict any disease. Frankly, this is one of those things that I spend my day job working on, uh, where I'm CEO of Allo Health, where we try to use data and AI-driven analytics to try to predict onset of disease, progression of disease, how to intervene in disease, et cetera. And I think this is something that's really important because if we get to that point, where we can understand, for example, what might the next set of mutations be in the context of COVID? What might the next wave be? Even if it's five different scenarios that we can start to suss out to, then we can start becoming preemptive. And this notion of being preemptive on a vaccine, well, it's not quite a cure, but it sure changes the time course of how we think about the delivery of an intervention and the potential for the spikes to never happen. And that could be very exciting. Um, but I also want to not just focus this on COVID because I think there's a lot of lessons here. Um, I mean, we've seen spikes of diseases before. We've seen it from, from a viral standpoint. Obviously, a hepatitis C is a longer, longer and slower uh, development, but it's been a global scourge for um, quite some time. The ability to intervene there, to be able to anticipate the ability to understand is very powerful there. Of course, we can roll the clock back 40 odd years and look at the onset of the HIV epidemic. And the ability, if one looks with the benefit of retrospection, um, of saying, could we have anticipated that? Could we have actually intervened before it happened? Would be incredibly powerful. But at the same time, while everything I've talked about is viral, I don't think these sorts of issues are limited to viruses. Because while COVID is new on the scene, in America, the number one killer is still heart disease. The number two killer is still cancer. And the same sort of logic of being able to predict onset, pre predict underlying etiology, and intervene before it becomes a hard set in disease is really powerful. And that's where I think we can learn to, we can learn so much 
from what happened in the context of COVID and try to extend it very broadly across a range of other therapeutic areas and have very significant and lasting benefit for human health. Thanks, David. And you've, you've covered some very essential parts. And I think that's something which sometimes uh, being in the moment we tend to forget is the sheer speed and innovation in what we've been doing in vaccines, right? I mean, I mean, we actually had a working vaccine in less than 12 months. And we didn't have one as a, country, as, as a world. We had three or four of them. I mean, uh, and kudos to regulatory authorities and to governments for actually having facilitated that entire movement to actually getting it out into the system. So I think that's something which, if, if there has been a silver lining, it is our ability now to innovate when it comes to health, especially from vaccines. And that's very important. Taking a lead from there, Yoshiki-san, I'd like to ask you a, a two-part question. Uh, as David is saying, I always do these in two parts now. The first one, of course, is what has been the economic cost of this entire uh, you know, from a healthcare perspective, especially with Japan, which has uh, definitely an aging population. So what has been the economic cost of taking of the healthcare part of this entire multiple waves? And why I'm asking that because as it becomes more of an endemic, perhaps that'll be a more of a sustained healthcare situation which will have to be there. And the second part is, has this overshadowed the other primary healthcare, as David Lilly said, about the other major killers, the, 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 the cancers, the heart diseases, the tuberculosis, and how, how, is, how is perhaps uh, Japan and the wider world going to be able to balance uh, these two major issues? Because sometimes I do believe that you know, people uh, tend to have forgotten, as David correctly said, that there are a lot of other major health issues in the world other than just the COVID pandemic, which is there. Right, right. Yes, uh, the, for the first part, the, the from the economic uh, point of view for the healthcare, the, uh, we couldn't do much uh, before we know the, the reality of COVID, but we gradually know that this uh, mainly affects people with uh, some existing diseases and also for the senior people. Therefore, we try to focus on that point so that we won't have, a, won't, do not have a cluster of these for these people, especially for the senior uh, care facilities. And the, uh, that, I think, worked uh, very well here. here. And the, uh, of course, depending on the uh, difference of the variant, we, the, the point we need to take care of is slightly changing. And with this Omicron wave, uh, it is very difficult to prevent uh, infections in the area with the same, I mean, who share the same common uh, space, so to speak. Therefore, uh, we need to work on based on that. Uh, and we have some um, cluster infections in, also in the senior facilities. But I think we can uh, effectively uh, enclose that by now. And the, for, uh, as you say, this effect uh, affect the, our medical resource to treat other diseases. And uh, this is uh, what we need to talk uh, from the viewpoint of the balance what is going to be the optimal for the society. Of course, that is uh, deducing the capacity of uh, the medical uh, resource uh, dealing with cancer or other operational uh, areas. Uh, but uh, there is also a sort of uh, trade-offs in between. So uh, people are trying to uh, take the best trade-offs and uh, there is a lot of debates going on in, in each different community, what is going to be the best uh, mix, including the home uh, treatment. So that is creating a sort of democratized way of, uh, say, adjusting the, uh, the best mix or the best uh, compromise point uh, from society point of view. And so uh, then people are now starting to learn how to uh, uh, do uh, the best uh, in the worst situation. And the, of course, we cannot uh, make it 
at zero tolerance uh, level, but uh, if we contain it under a controllable level, then people need to be satisfied with that. And then the society is now sharing that common understanding of how to treat this kind of disease. So I think this has been a very good exercise for the society uh, to not become uh, too much hysteric on what is happening, but see the reality and to get uh, the social uh, I mean, process of uh, social getting social consensus of what we should do. So I think overall, this has been a very good lesson for us, I think. Thank you so much. And I want to take a lead from what Yoshiki-san said, and maybe a small deviation, and David would love to have your inputs on this. What's happening, you know, I mean, one of the major surprises is, and, and this is something perhaps more from a Global South perspective, is we see a huge amount, I mean, not a majority, thank God for small mercies, we still see a huge amount of vaccine skepticism, right? I mean, uh, these are educated people. These are people who, who who we would have thought should know better. And yet we see so many people, especially in, in, in the U.S. Uh, we saw this protest in Canada. And now we, of course, see we also things in Europe where people, after having vaccines available, I mean, are not taking it. Uh, two questions, cause and perhaps effect of this, both of this. And I'm not putting in a small spot over there, but yeah, I mean, you know, where's the fun if I don't do that? No, no, this is, this is, this is a really interesting, really interesting question. Let me, let me try to touch on the second part first. Um, I actually, I actually have sort of really significant questions in my mind of what, around what the effect is. Now, on one hand, we could ask, was the underlying cause that people were pushing back for the simple reason that they were being forced to do it? And, and I think we all remember the time when we were a kid right? And our mother or our father said, clean the table or whatever it was. And we would say no, just because someone was telling us to do something. So in a way, could it be that that has something to do with it? Maybe it's just the adult version of it. But let's, let's assume that that's the case. That's actually kind of a comforting case, right? Because the thing I worry about is what happens when people who resist vaccines get to a point in their life where they're at risk for heart disease, where they're at risk, where, where they get diagnosed with cancer, where they get diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, where they get diagnosed with some other very difficult to manage ailment. Are they going to start refusing treatment en masse? It becomes a really interesting question. Now, the reality is, I doubt it. Because the number of people that, we, that I think we collectively know who get diagnosed with some form of cancer where there's at least a what I'll call a hope of extending life, who refuse treatment, incredibly rare, right? End stage is a very different story because it's quality of, quality of end of life. But earlier, people seem pretty ready to take that sort of therapy. And, and I think it's important because as long as there's continued trust in the drug development system and medical system, I think we have a very viable system. The second that people start questioning the intent of the companies that are discovering and developing drugs, we're dealing with a very different challenge and a very different problem. Because ultimately, and as someone who went to medical school myself, um, when you ask the question, why do people go to medical school? Well, it's not to try to implant chips through subterfuge of creating a vaccine through a pandemic or something along those lines. It's because you actually want to genuinely help people. And, and I think we have to remember that, that the intent behind all of this is to genuinely help people. So I say that because the thing that I worry the most about is does this bleed into other areas of medicine? If it doesn't, so be it. If it does, then I think we have a big challenge on our hands. Again, the reason I, I point to this is if we just step back one, one bit from where we are today um, and we start asking the question of, you know, what is the risk and the harm of people not taking the COVID, their COVID vaccines? Well, I mean, on one level, it's debatable. On another level, it's not, right? Which is that we know from the statistics that people who are not getting their vaccines are more likely to suffer themselves from hospitalization, from death, um, and it's real. But people are allowed to choose, as far as I'm concerned, they're allowed to choose how to manage components of their, uh, of their health. 
The issue here is that this isn't isolated. And what they're allowing to do is to keep the reservoir open for longer. And that's why I think there's been such a big concern. But I think it's that attitude that's bring, brought on this mandate version of it. And I think what we're seeing is this large scale pushback on mandates. I think, I mean, I would argue now. there's no way to know. There's no way to know if we, if there, if we had re-rolled this out with some sort of incentive and encouragement system, we might have a very, very different world today, but who knows? It's all, um, it's very easy to speculate on what could have happened and what would have happened because reality is I don't think we all under, understand underlying cause and it's become a huge political issue, well blown out of proportion in my opinion. Thanks, David, for that insight. Yoshiki san is, is there an end game to this? Or, I mean, is, is this going to be an, an endless cycle of, of, of waves? Uh, and, and what is that end game going to be looking out from, from, from perhaps a, a hospice a healthcare perspective, from, from a Japanese health perspective? I mean, where do, where, where do you think this is going to go? I mean, I mean, we've been through this for two years. I mean, everyone is at the end of the tether now. Uh, what happens next? In your opinion? Uh, I mean, uh, the we are I'm, uh, generally uh, here. Uh, people are now uh, starting to think that normal life is coming back. Already. So uh, the question is: uh, the when the next wave uh, would come, then uh, what type of measure we should take? But I think already we are prepared for doing that, and uh, uh, Japan is relatively uh, easily managed country because people are mostly me to mentality. Therefore, uh, and the the reason they take uh, vaccination is not to harm other people or not to uh, bear a burden to other people, including medical professionals, for example. Therefore, uh, if you are not, you are saying that you are not taking vaccine, then you are uh, thought as very selfish. So that's how, uh, uh, I mean, the social norm, so to speak. Therefore, it is, we, we are lucky in the sense uh, we can manage people easily easier than the people in the United States, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's, that's one of the major takeaways, right? It is as much of a medical uh, situation or a health issue as it, as it has been a societal situation, right? I mean, that's something we, we tend to sometimes forget. David, we, we, we saw an interesting guest. She's most welcome to join us in the panel if she wishes to. No, we'd we love to have her. Uh, so She may well join yeah. <laughs> uh, they want to put a question to you. I mean, just you know, as if the world wasn't a complicated place already, as if we were we we we, we were we didn't have enough on our plate with the world just coming out. We have this horrible situation just come up in Eastern Europe with the entire uh, you know invasion, and that's there, let's not put it in. A, it is an invasion, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. How does that play into this entire endemic? And I'm now going to move, you know, perhaps a step forward and say, rather than pandemic, it's moving into an endemic. So how does this affect the entire fight against endemic from a healthcare socioeconomic perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, uh, it, it, it's a great question. Um, I think as we, as we look at it, there's a couple of dynamics I think that we're seeing already. One, at the risk of sounding cynical, um, obviously this is capturing the headlines. And it should, because this is incredibly important. This is a um, globally altering event. And I think we're already seeing some of the impacts of that. Um, now, what's the impact of a global altering event on the heels of a pandemic? Well, people are spending a lot less time thinking about the pandemic and paying attention to the pandemic. And I expect the people to lower their guard on the pandemic. And that's, that's also scary, because let's say Omicron didn't cause sufficient immune response to create natural immunity across the entirety of the population. Well, might we be slightly less armed for another wave? Very possibly. I mean, this is one of those things where I think we have to remain vigilant and independent of politics. This is, this is real. This is, this is stuff that is killing lots of people. It's continuing to, it's, it's a virus we still don't un truly understand. Um, you may have seen that the U.S. Senate recent, recently, 
today, I think, um, tried to eliminate the state of emergency, if you will, uh, for the U.S. associated with COVID, um, which is just, I think, speaking to the fact that people are just taking it less seriously. Um, and, and, and I think that's something that's, it's real. Uh, and I think we have to, we have to be, we have to be cognizant of it. Do I think that what's going on in Ukraine is going to exacerbate directly COVID? Probably not because we're not in an environment where it's, uh, where the contagion is, is where, where the, the spread has been limited to very few parts of the world at this point. It's already out there. It's already all over the place. The new variants don't seem to be coming from, uh, coming from Eastern Europe. So I think that the actual invasion itself is not going to drive this per se, but the ancillary effects uh, may very well exacerbate what happens in the future. And if we don't have sufficient mind share and air share, if you will, or time share um, in discussing what's ongoing, then who knows if the next phase of this actually is a lot worse than we're anticipating. Yoshiki-san, what is your opinion on this entire thing with, with this entire thing opening up now? Or do you feel this is going to play out? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the uh, like um, uh, COVID uh, this time, the the bottom-up uh, information sharing is working very well in this kind of invasion situation. And the uh, we, we cannot, uh, I mean, the attack Russia by ourselves and the people in that country you need to decide what to do and the we need uh, at least we need to uh, convey our opinion to these people uh, who look at this uh, with a, a biased uh, controlled information inside the country I don't know if that reaches to major part of the population, but uh, of course we can see the sign that people are uh, at least uh, having some input from outside. So uh, I, I think with this, uh, we show that as a, a global citizen, every people in every country have the similar uh, I mean, uh, opinion uh, except uh, the uh, country which is totally controlled by one uh, person, so to speak. And then uh, this, uh, I think this kind of uh, democratized information sharing uh, in most cases work well, uh, including this Omicron situation. And the, of course, the emergency, the sense of emergency uh, is uh, towards this uh, abrupt, uh, the physical attack of a, a country. But uh, I think uh, all people in most cases, uh, at least if they have a balanced mentality, uh, think uh, this kind of uh, tool that every people now have through our uh, intelligent phones uh, will create a very good uh, barrier to that sort of uh, evil in the society, so to speak. So I think this is overall, I'm, I'm uh, optimistic of uh, in the mid to long run, we can... Uh, I mean, control this type of situation. In the past, it was very difficult. Thank you, uh, David. I'm going to ask you a question, which, 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 which I think a lot of us would ask ourselves, and that is, of course, with the benefit of hindsight. In your opinion, if there was one thing you know the world could have done differently in the entire in this entire COVID saga to have perhaps reduced the pain or increased the effectiveness of cure or vaccination and just make sure this is far less than what it is now, what would that step have been and when would it have been? Again, hindsight, uh, obviously, I mean, ifs and buts, but yes, we'd love to have your opinion on that. Well, I don't think we could have had this because we weren't in a state to have it, but I think the thing we would, would have been great to have is a broad, open information sharing system. And... I think this is something that still would be tremendously useful because right now, I think as we look at any given disease, as we look at any given health uh, aspect of health, 
even within a given state of the United States, not, not even the country, health information is incredibly hard to come by. So I think if we think about it in the context of COVID, right, I think if we had transparent, open, honest information from day one, probably predicting the risk that was associated with it and allowing countries to act sooner, I think what could have been transformative. I think that would, allow, would have allowed more groups to do probably hard lockdowns for acute periods of time and potentially nip it in the bud. Now, it might have still gotten out because the challenge, of course, on COVID is the up to two week incubation time, and that makes it particularly infectious. And I think that's something we can't lose sight of. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think the notion of having these sorts of information systems is incredibly useful because as I think about how we want to think about treatments and cures across the medical system on a go forward basis, data is the foundation of it. If we can't get the data that's necessary to understand disease, how do you expect us to understand disease and how do you expect us to be able to treat disease? And I think the errant component on this is that people view health data as something that they don't want to separate on, separate out of because it's particularly invasive. Yet, when people go online and they go to Facebook or they go to whatever the, they want, they post all sorts of information about themselves, which is done for, call it personal attention. What it does, of course, is it helps companies like a Google or an Amazon help you figure, figure out a better widget to buy, anything from a, a toilet paper you might like a little bit better or the next book you should read. But, and while I have no disrespect for toilet paper or books, the reality is data that is way less useful in its own and way less identifiable to you on its own is actually way more helpful to the health of you and the health of your loved ones than the sort of data that people are freely giving up that is way more identifiable today. I think that's something we've lost sight of. And if we could make even national health data systems, that would be a great step. If we had an international one, it would be even better. But I know this is a bit of a story of a pipe dream right now, because as I look in the United States, being able to have one at the scale of a town still doesn't exist. Well, I think it's more of an issue with intent than with the tools, isn't it? I mean, the intent, if the intent was that the tools are already there, it's just the intent from a larger society perspective and from an individual perspective seems to be lacking. Uh, we're coming towards the end of this. Time always flows. Um, so, uh, Yushikan, in, 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 in one minute, uh, how, uh, as you now this has become an endemic, let's be really honest, or it's almost there. How has Japan changed as a society in the past uh, two yes. years? Uh, it's a very good trigger for Japan to uh, come to digital age. We've been a very traditional society and nothing uh, went through without physical uh, exchange. But this, uh, co- with this COVID, people are now starting to learn how to exchange or how to communicate remotely. I think this is a very good thing for Japan because uh, we are very slowly moving, so to speak. <laughs> Therefore, we are a little bit catching up. <laughs> Thank you so much, yoshi san uh, David, last words. Uh, are we going to see a cure on this? And uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, where do we go from here? you got a minute. So we'd love to, for you to conclude on that. Sure. Well, I think what we're hoping for is to get ourselves to a point where this is stable, it's manageable, it's predictable. What I'm most optimistic about is that we can take the lessons for this and create a much brighter future for medicine and use these sorts of insights to think about how we can make medicine predictive and something where we can get cures, not just for something like a COVID, but for well beyond that. Thanks, David. Uh, you know, I think what, 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 what I understand from you know, talking to both of you is that perhaps we've, the worst is behind us. Uh, there is hope on the horizon, but we, we've got to be careful because there, there, there are always going to be new challenges coming. And if we don't learn from this entire two years, then, then we've only got ourselves to blame for it. That's very important. Uh, history has a way of repeating itself. Let's make sure we're prepared for the next time that history repeats itself. Because with, with the digital age and with information and with the world coming together, those iterative loops of repetition are going to be faster and faster and faster. David and Yoshikisan, it's been a privilege. It's been a pleasure interacting with both of you. You've been both so lucid in your, in, your, in your talk and, of course, in your insights. And I'm sure all the people who attend this and even when they see this in the recording are going to understand perspectives which will put up in a help them 
and guide them in their way forward. Thank you, both of you. It's been a pleasure and a privilege moderating this panel with both of you. Wish you all the very best. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Take care, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Yeah.